and I have a demonstration that I'm going to create a new product for you and I'm going to show you that I can sell it in one unit, buy it in another and store it in another. So I talk about unit conversion for you. So at this time, I don't necessarily care about the sales taxes, but we have discussed a lot about the sales tax in finance series. So I recommend a refresher for you to observe the finance course. But here, when you're buying or when you're selling, what would be the default item sales tax group? And then by the time you set that up, that becomes a default, yet you can override it. When I click OK, obviously the product gets created and gets authorized within Seahorse Retailer. And as you can tell, when I click on a validate from the action pane, if there's any issue with this product, it will be appeared. But at this time, it says that you have answered all the necessary piece of information so you can start using this item. However, we are not necessarily finished with the setup of this as the best practices. Number one is a standard model group. That means my costing is based on a standard costing. Therefore, you need to have a cost associated with this item and you need to say how much it's going to cost you. Later, I'm going to show you how to set that up. I carry on and I now switch back to the definition and I search for this ebook. And as you see, the definition behind the scene has already been defined for me. So when you do a decentralized way of creating a product, automatically the definition is getting created on the product definition and is shared across all the legal entities immediately. But if you notice on your fact box, you have authorized by company. That means this product is only available in seahorse retailers and is not available in any other legal entity. So therefore, if you are going to authorize this specific product in other legal entities, there is a button at the top of the action pane called release products. Therefore, you define exactly what legal entities this product can reside on. So in future demonstration, you're about to see that. At the moment, I switch back to release products and I create a few more of my raw materials. So my ebook could come perhaps in a white case. As a best practice, I always recommend it strongly to specify the default order setting. And we have a lots of other demonstration coming here. And these are very important policies. And here, is a section that you can also dictate how master planning will work and calculate to see how much or how many of this specific product you need to buy. When I say how much, I mean like what's a kilogram or what's the quantity, what's the volume of it. What would be the default site? At this time, I have only one site and I assume site one represents the entire North America. If you don't specify any value here, later on when you're using it in other documents such as a purchase order or vendor invoice or whatnot, you need to manually define those information. But when you set these values here, then it gets defaulted. So it's the best practice to set this up, specifically when it comes to bill of material generation. If you don't have a site here, you won't be able to set up the bill of material properly. So I specify the site and there are other tabs that are available in here, which we're going to get into the detail of it in more later on. As you see, the site is there. You can make it to be a mandatory site. That means it has to have that site. You can specify the minimum order quantity, maximum order quantity. You can have a lead time for master planning. There are lots of stuff here that we're going to come back and we're going to demonstrate throughout the rest of the sessions. It would be a bit overwhelming to go through all these things theoretically in a high level. You should see it as part of a demonstration. It makes a lot more sense that way. As you can tell, this is not a catch weight product. So therefore, the CW section is faded. Similar to the purchase order, you could also click on an inventory and specify by the time you want to transfer from one warehouse to the other, what would be the minimum or maximum order quantity? What would be the multiple? You're going to see all these things in activities, as I said. Again, the delivery control will be demonstrated for you. The lead time will be controlled and demonstrated for you. And then finally, the sales order. How many requires to be sold as minimum? Again, these are all default values. You can override them depending on your policies. But this is the first form that we have a lot of talk coming later. I close this form and then one side could have multiple warehouses. Therefore, there's a side a specific order setting. If I open this up, it says, okay, for which side, which warehouse am I going to use as a default? So I use the 100 as a default. Later on, I'm going to use the concept of multiple warehouses to be assigned here. So we start very small and simple and they grow and make it more complicated. Similar behavior, if I go back to the purchase order or inventory or sales order, all the information will be inherited from the site, but yet you could override them. There's an override checkbox on every single one of these tab pages. 
I click close. Now, this is the best practice. I recommend you strongly to always do that and also consult your customers in order to make sure by the time they define the product, set up all these default values. If you don't, which I'm going to demonstrate, you'll see that it still can carry on, but you have more data entry that you need to specify. And sometimes you have no other choice because you don't know what side would be the default. You don't know what warehouse. Maybe it's on demand. So you need to specify all those information. So at least I make one product to look like that. I can click edit and you can take a look at the default product form. The lots of properties here over time they're going to discuss some of the most important one as part of a supply chain series